welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. First, the education report. Dan Friedel and Jill Robbins bring us a story about colleges and universities in the United States that have put academics ahead of sports. Brian Lynn shares a story about a popular word puzzle. I will return with a success story about a professional woman golfer in Senegal. Finally, Gregory Stockel will share a story about droughts affecting parts of Africa. But first, Dan and Jill bring us the education report. In January, the University of Georgia defeated the University of Alabama to win the college football championship in the United States. It was not a surprise to see the two schools in the final game because they were among the best in the nation. What is surprising, however, is that two other famous football teams from the neighboring state of Florida were so far from the best. The University of Florida is in the city of Gainesville, and Florida State University is in Tallahassee. Both are in the northern part of the state, close to Georgia and Alabama. The teams lost more times than they won. That is different from the recent past, when they were among the best in the nation. The last year both schools had a good year was 2016. That is about the same time Florida and Florida State started getting national attention for their academic programs. The two schools are now seen as top choices for students in the southeastern United States. U.S. News and World Report recently rated Florida 5th and Florida State 19th among public universities. In the 1990s and early 2000s, Florida, also known as UF, was rated about 50th among all U.S. universities. The school is now listed at 28th. Other publications, including Forbes and the Wall Street Journal, also gave the schools high ratings on their lists. Chris Chenard is one person who knows about the academic programs at the University of Florida. He completed his advanced degree in chemistry there in 2016. He is now a professor at Florida Institute of Technology. Chenard said when he was younger, he had a different idea about the big Florida schools. I grew up thinking of a place like the University of Florida as a school that's really good at football and probably really good at partying, but not necessarily the best in terms of academics. Well, come to find out that that's not the truth. Chenard said the rise of the academic programs at the University of Florida has been meteoric. He credited President Kent Fox with pushing the school to think of itself as one of the best public universities in the nation, alongside the University of California, Berkeley, the University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of Michigan. Before coming to Florida, Fox was the top academic officer at Cornell University, an Ivy League university. Fox helped Florida raise money, add more professors, and increase attendance. In 2020, the university announced a partnership with technology company NVIDIA 
to create an artificial intelligence and machine learning center. One of the founders of NVIDIA is Chris Malakowski, a graduate of the University of Florida. Chenard said, The university's push to be a leader in machine learning will put it in a leadership position for science and technology education. Ayobami Edun, a Nigerian, is working on an advanced degree in electrical engineering at the University of Florida. He said he heard about the schools in Florida because his Nigerian university had a relationship with Florida A&M University, another college in Tallahassee. Aidan said he chose Florida because I found out UF was the best in Florida. There's a very intense level of research at UF, he said. And whether you're going to go into academia or industry, the classes prepare you. At Florida State, former President John Thrasher started an effort to raise $1 billion for the university when he took the job in 2015. Part of the money went toward hiring more professors and helping students pay for college costs. The new president, Richard McCullough, came from Harvard and Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where he led programs in information science and biology. His arrival shows the university will continue to support strong academic programs. The school also centers its effort on keeping students and helping them graduate. Stephen McDowell is a leader in the university's College of Communications. He said, FSU has gotten recognition for the four-year graduation rate. That's good for the students who start their careers sooner. And it also gets attention in the national rankings. Between 1993 and 2013, Florida and Florida State combined to have the best college football team six times. But now, the schools are struggling in football, the most popular college sport in the U.S. David Hale writes about college football for the sports publication ESPN. He said... When a school can select more top students, it makes it harder for people who are great athletes but not strong students to get into the school. Hale said university leaders have a difficult choice. Are they more concerned with investing in ac academics and getting your U.S. News and World Report rankings higher, or are they more invested in making sure that the athletics is successful and you're packing up 80,000 uh, person stadium every Saturday and you're winning championships. Hale said when investment in academics produces better results than money spent on football, it becomes easier to invest in school programs than new sports buildings or a costly new coach. Hale put it this way. You have more investment in your state and you have higher achieving workers and you can attract bigger companies to come there and set up uh, headquarters to create jobs because you have that skilled uh, labor. And all of that stuff has very real, significant, long-term effects that are much more positive than a winning football season is. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Jill Robbins. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Jill. Now, let's hear from Brian Lynn. You might have heard of the word game Wordle. Maybe you have even tried the game yourself. The online puzzle has become so popular that some people cannot go a day without it. Many players share their game results on social media. On November 1st, only 90 people had ever played Wordle. 
Within two months, that number had grown to 300,000. Social media users, especially famous people, helped grow the popularity of the game. Wordle is a very simple game. That may be why its popularity spread so quickly and widely. Compared to many other computer games, the design is also very simple. It contains just 30 empty squares appearing under the name Wordle. Players get six chances to guess a five-letter word that has been chosen by the game for that day. The goal is to guess the word in the least number of tries. To start, players enter a real word. Then the letters turn different colors to provide the player clues about the word. A green letter means the letter is in the word and is in the right position. Yellow means the letter appears in the word but is in the wrong place. A gray letter means it does not appear in the word at all. The game is web-based, not an app. So users do not need to download it. It is also free to play. Users can play the game once per day. Wordle was created by Josh Wardle, a New York software engineer. He said he first made it for his partner, who likes playing word games like crossword puzzles. But he decided in October to release it publicly. The game immediately took off. It became so successful that the New York Times recently announced it had bought the game from Wardle. The newspaper did not say exactly how much it paid for the game, but it did say the price was in the low seven figures. The Times is already known for its wildly popular crossword puzzle and other games. The decision immediately drew criticism from some fans on social media. Many said they feared the newspaper would not keep the game free for users. The Times currently requires users to pay a subscription to read news content on its website. It also offers unlimited online gameplay for $1.25 a week. In a statement, the newspaper said, at the time it moves to the New York Times, Wordle will be free to play for new and existing players and no charges will be made to its gameplay. In a message on Twitter, Wardle said he was pleased with the deal. He suggested he was working with the Times to make sure the game would remain free. He added that the game had gotten bigger than I ever imagined, and he noted that users had shared stories about how the game had helped unite distant family members and supported those recovering from sickness. As Wordle has grown, so has the number of experts offering advice for the best ways to play the game. One language expert, David Sidhu, recently gave his opinion on the best words to start a game with. And the website Bustle offered a series of tips from TikTok and Twitter users on how to better play the game. Sidhu lists the most common letters from English words. The top letters he provides are A, R, O, I, and S. When considering these and what positions the letters most commonly appear in, Sidhu came up with a suggestion for the best starting word for Wordle. 
That word is soar, which means a young hawk. It is a British English word that was used commonly in the 1700s, the Collins English Dictionary reports. Another possibility is the word Sammy, another British English word that describes something that is not unusual or interesting. Some Twitter and TikTok users suggested starting words of either clout or weird. Clout means having power and influence over other people or events. Weird means very strange or unusual. Other popular suggestions on social media include using words with the most common vowels, a, E, I, O, or U, or the most commonly used English consonants, R, T, N, and S. I'm Brian Lynn. Thanks, Brian. When Ume Jai first started competing against men in the sport of golf, she was not confident. She said she felt a little afraid. And she said the men did not want to golf with her, nor did they take her seriously. But then she won her first game. After that, she had all the confidence she needed to keep playing and defeating male golfers. Jai is the only professional female golfer in Senegal. She competes almost only against men. As she walks on the golf course in Sally, Senegal, she talks to other golfers, who are all men. Now I am used to playing with men. I train in the morning, noon, and night. I am in the gym three or four times per week, she said, so that also gives me confidence. Jai became a professional player seven years ago. That means she is paid for competing in the sport. She has won many competitions, including ones in Thailand, Kenya, and South Africa. She was introduced to golf by her brother-in-law and immediately fell in love. Golf is a complete sport, she said. You walk, you think, and you concentrate. And it is physical, too. Not long after she began competing, Jai was given a chance to train in Morocco. With the financial support... From her French golf partners in Sally, she spent three months training with the Moroccan Golf Federation. She said she enjoyed the experience so much that she returned to Morocco and stayed for seven years. While there, she also taught children at a golfing school. Today, her home is filled with many golfing awards. She has won so many that she does not know the exact number. Or in other words, she says she has lost track. What she has done is notable because Senegal is a conservative Muslim nation. Observers say there is pressure from society for women not to be involved in professional sports. More than 95% of Senegalese are Muslim. The country practices a more liberal form of Islam. However, the culture still has traditional ideas of what women should do. A woman who chooses sports over duties at home 
risks being rejected by her family. When you are Muslim, we prefer to keep girls at home, to find them a husband, and make them a housewife, she said. At first, her family was not supportive. But after seeing her love of the sport, they changed their minds. They permitted her to leave Dakar to move in with her brother-in-law, near the golf course in Sally. Now Jai lives with her four children and husband. He not only plays golf with her, but often carries her golf equipment for her. In 2018, when Jai returned from Morocco, she was not happy about the state of golf in her home country. She wanted to create a golf school similar to the one in Morocco. In order to develop golf, we need to focus on the kids, she said. The Senegalese Golf Federation was founded in 1991. There are now about 30 professional players around the country. But the group does not have a lot of money. There also are only two golf courses in the country. In 2020, the Federation agreed to help Jai establish a golf school in preparation for the 2026 Summer Youth Olympics in Dakar. It will be the first Olympic Games of any kind to be held in Africa. The 2022 Games were postponed because of the coronavirus pandemic. It will be Jai's job to train Senegal's first national golf team. This will involve preparing female golfers, including her own daughter. The president of the Senegal Golf Federation is Baidi Agne. He said the federation is prepared and committed to support the girls in their training equally with the boys. Women make up the majority of the population in Senegal, Agne added, and they must not be left behind. Umi can be a very good role model for these girls, he said. Umi Jai says she hopes to find a sponsor so she can continue to compete internationally and bring the next generation of Senegalese female golfers into the world. I'm Ana Mateo. Here is Gregory Stockel with our last story. Somalia, Kenya, and now Ethiopia are warning of a severe drought that threatens millions of people in eastern Africa. In Ethiopia's Somali area, people have seen the failures of what should have been three straight rainy seasons. Droughts do come and go over the years. However, the lack of rainfall has led to the driest conditions in 40 years in parts of Somalia and Ethiopia. UNICEF is the United Nations Children's Agency. Local Zainab Wali told a visiting team with UNICEF that she and her seven children have never seen a drought like this. She said the government gave out food and food for animals during the last drought five years ago. This time, we don't have enough food for our family. Children walk among the bodies of dead animals, which are dying from lack of food and energy. UNICEF said on February 1st that more than 6.8 million people in Ethiopia are expected to need urgent humanitarian aid by mid-March. 
Somalia Consortium works to improve international aid for Somalia. It said in a separate statement that in neighboring Somalia, more than 7 million people need urgent help. It is asking international actors to give much more to the country. We are just one month into the long, dry season, and I have already lost 25 goats and sheep, Hafsa Badel in Ethiopia's Somali area told UNICEF. She also lost four camels, a large desert animal, as well. She said there is nowhere for her animals to eat. She added that there is not enough food for her own family, including her six children. UNICEF estimates that more than 150,000 children in such areas of Ethiopia have dropped out of school. They are needed to help find the limited amount of water and help their families with other work. One young boy was seen supporting a work animal, a donkey. The donkey was once important for transporting supplies, but now it had become too weak to walk on its own. Gianfranco Rutiano is UNICEF's Ethiopia representative. He said during a meeting with the UN, we have animals dying at an impressive rate, which is increasing every month, and the death of animals means lack of food for children, for families. Rutiano said some water sources were drying up or already dry. He pointed to the need to help improve these sources and to build new ones. He added that water needs to get to health and food systems. Meanwhile, the country is experiencing conflict with fighters from the country's northern Tigray area. It has displaced hundreds of thousands of people. The areas experiencing drought are hundreds of kilometers to the southeast. Rutiano said this conflict has had no effects on UNICEF's response to the areas seeing drought. I'm Gregory Stockel. Thanks, Gregory. And that's our program for today. Thank you for listening. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.